Our text for tonight is Hebrews 6, 4, and 6. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. At this point, we pause and ask the church historians just what is impossible regarding those people who have been blessed with every gift and power that God gives to men on earth. To our question, we receive the unanimous and reassuring answer that it is impossible for people once so mightily endowed ever wholly to lose the gospel. God has not given his greatest gift to men, we are assured, simply to have them turn their backs on him. It is possible, or rather, is it possible, they ask, or is it even conceivable that churchmen, the churchmen ask that after such great blessings and signs and wonders to the church, God should ever remove his spirit from it. Is it possible that he should remove his church from the earth after he's given them everything? Here is the answer of the apostle, and the apostolic fathers later confirm it with passion. It is possible, it is entirely possible for those who have received the greatest promises and blessings that heaven ever bestows to lose everything. The words of the author of Hebrews, as of all the apostolic fathers as well, are meant to be a warning against just that. What is not possible is that men who have once lost those blessings should ever again regain them by any efforts of their own. Or as Paul says, it is impossible if they shall fall away, speaking of these people, to renew them again unto repentance. That is not possible. Our author then compares such people with ground which has become overgrown with thorns and briars. Other land, he says, can drink rain from heaven and bring forth vegetation when the time of refreshment comes. But for that land which was once rich in goodly herbs and then turns to weeds, there is no such hope. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end it is to be burned. The pastor of Hermas reminds the church again and again that after a certain day, soon to come, it will no longer be possible for Christians to repent or reform, though repentance will continue to remain open indefinitely to the heathen. There is, we are informed in this wonderful writing, a point of no return for the church, beyond which you can't reform it. Perhaps the foremost living authority on church history, the history of Christianity in general, the German Lutheran scholar Heinrich Bornkamp, has stated in a recent book that there are just two periods in church history. The first, he says, is that of Hellenization, that is, the absorption of antique sacramental religion into the early Catholic and medieval churches. And the second, he describes as the period of the purging of the church of these foreign elements following the Reformation, that is, the epoch of recapturing the prophetic religiosity of primitive Christianity. End of quote. Read in the light of conventional church histories of the past, this statement is really quite an astonishing admission, first of the extent to which alien and unchristian things came to displace the real gospel, and second of the fact that any return to the pure religion of Christ must necessarily be a return to prophetic religion. Can one return to such, or can such a return be achieved by reformation? It cannot. For one thing, Bornkamp speaks as if the pagan elements in Christianity were a single concrete intrusion of some foreign body into the organism, a hard, unassimilated lump, which needed simply to be rejected in one piece to restore perfect health to the ailing system. Yet no one or describes better than Bornkamp how long and thorough the process of assimilation had been. The teachings of the schools and the practices of the world have become an integral part of the organism. They have transformed it completely. We have already quoted scholars of various faiths who all marvel at the perfect organic union of the Christian and classical traditions into a new and perfectly integrated whole. Could the church suddenly and easily slough off what had been completely assimilated into its very being for over a thousand years to return again to what she had been before the great compromise with the world? Can one reconvert a petrified organism that's been transmuted from one substance to another through the centuries, molecule by molecule? Or to use the figure employed by the Lord himself, when salt has lost its flavor, there's only one thing to do with it, he says. Throw it out. It's no good anymore. To corrupt the gospel is to lose it. The plan of salvation and the church of Jesus Christ may not be changed without being lost, and when lost may not be regained by any process of reformation. This is not narrowness or pedantry. We see it 
in all our basic institutions. When a language is changed, whether for better or for worse, that language is lost, and the only way we can find it again is to discover ancient and undefiled sources. All the zeal in the world can never reform us back to early English. A French scholar has recently asked how we can revive classical studies by reproducing what he calls the miracle of the Renaissance. The Renaissance wasn't a revival of ancient learning, but a wholly new type of learning based on the study of the ancients, and what brought it about was not the work of reformers, but the accidental discovery of ancient texts preserved in their purity by centuries of complete neglect, and is comparative purity. Consider the gospel in this light. When the covenants were broken and the ordinances changed and the churches taught for doctrines the commandments of men, the old gospel was simply, lo simply no longer there. Today, church historians, Protestant and Catholic alike, agree that this happened. And they easily reconciled themselves to the situation by insisting that what took place and what took the place of the old church in the second, third centuries was really something much better, something far more fit for survival in a wicked world, something much more realistic, much more available to the grasp and amenable to the taste of the average man. The early church, they explain, was something hopelessly impractical and extremely limited in popular appeal. Therefore, it had to go. It was a mere tiny acorn from which a mighty oak was to grow, and so forth and so on. Well, what interests us here is not their explanation and justification of what happened, but the admission that it did happen. The primitive church was changed, and thereby the primitive church was lost. And to this we add the thesis that such a loss was an irreversible process. Reformation could no more bring it back than it could bring back old English or 18th century monarchy or the thinking of the Scipionic circle. In the earliest Christian writings, we often come across the prediction regarding the future of the church that the sheep would turn to wolves. Well, what would they be in that case? A new breed of sheep? Not a bit of it. The sheep as such would cease to exist. However loudly, the wolves might continue to call themselves sheep and parade their Christian background and tradition and name. The Lord and the apostles used the example of the salt that is spoiled, the tares that destroy the wheat field until they can be burned, the wolves that destroy the flock and the sheep that turn into wolves precisely because weeds and wolves and briars and salt that is no longer salt are things that can never be reformed. They are beyond saving. It was common for the earliest Christian writers to speak of the church as a virgin. Up to this time, wrote Hegesippus, the earliest source we have, as a matter of fact, speaking of the end of the apostolic age, up to this time, he says, the church had remained a pure and uncorrupted virgin. Can that status when lost, and Hegesippus then says it was lost, can that status ever be acquired again? What about repentance, you ask? Wasn't Israel, though her sins were red as blood, to be washed white as snow? Yes, but never by reformation, always by restoration. If Israel is ever renewed, it must be by a new covenant and a new Jerusalem and a new prophet. And such can never be worked out by men here below. They must always come from above. Such a renewal did come in the time of Christ. He restored the gospel to the earth. He didn't attempt to reform the doctrines and institutions he found there. As a reformer, he would have been welcomed by the Jewish and Hellenic worlds. As we've noted before, reform was in the air, and the early Christians greatly offended by refusing to join in the ecumenical movements of the time. Christ brought the true teachings of Moses, Abraham, and the prophets, but he didn't obtain them by antiquarian researches. He made no attempt to establish historical continuity with them, as all the Christian churches do. What he brought to men, he brought directly from the presence of the Father. That's why it was identical with what the other prophets had received, not because he got it from them, but because they too had received direct revelation from on high. As Eusebius tells us, in every dispensation, the eternal gospel is brought to the earth as something new. We have talked on this before. What we want to emphasize now is that the Lord never renews his work on earth by reforming old things alone. The gospel is not built on old traditions. When God sets up his work in any age of the world, he chooses his own instruments, and they are bright and shining ones, clean and undefiled, whether institutions or men and women. He doesn't leave them to guess and wonder as the great reformers, Protestant and Catholic, do through decades of perplexity and doubt, but he calls them directly from heaven, often as children, as David and Samuel and Nephi and Joseph Smith were called before they have any knowledge of the world at all. A reformer takes his cue from the world about him, which he's going to reform. A prophet never does. The sad state of the world may lead one to call upon God, as Lehi did, and as a result, God may speak to one directly. But the mere recognition that this is a wicked world and that the divine order is sorely needed and it doesn't constitute a call from God to establish that order. The Lord chose his apostles from among men who showed no signs of wishing to reform the world. 
Each being apparently resigned to his position in life, Paul was actually a reactionary, seeking to defend the status quo when the Lord called him. A reformer is one keenly aware of abuses in the world about him who wants to do all he can to remedy things. Any honest and alert person can discover on every side much need for reform in this dark and dreary world. And God expects us all to engage in such activities on our own initiative, as did the Good Samaritan, for example. But God's work is not founded on the wickedness of men. There's nothing negative about it. Who doesn't know that men are foolish and wicked? It needs no ghost come from the dead, my Lord, to tell us that, to quote Horatio. If the purpose of man's existence were but to remedy evil, he would be dependent of the devil. If the Gentiles have not charity, said the Lord to the brother of Jared, what's that to thee? There's nothing negative in the gospel. If we have said a great deal about the falling away and the loss of the true gospel and to, ma to mankind in ancient times in these talks, let's make it clear here and now that such teaching is not part of the gospel. That doesn't belong at all. It's not found in the articles of faith. It has no bearing at all on the plan of life and salvation. Joseph Smith almost never referred to it, nor have the prophets since. We only mention the great apostasy because it's an historical point on which we're constantly being challenged. How can you say, we are asked every day, that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored to the earth if the Christian church has never ceased to be here? Well, one answer to that is found in the reformer's activity. Let's, let's make it clear that attempts to reform the Christian church to its lost state of pristine purity didn't begin with Luther, incidentally. There have always been reformers. In every century since the apostles, men have made a determined attempt to reform the church, and they've always run into the same problem that Luther did, namely the question, who has the right to inaugurate reform? We know who can amend the Constitution, as we know who established it. But with the church, it's an entirely different thing. It was established by Jesus Christ personally. If any amendments, changes, or reforms are in order, they should be his doing. But how can that be unless he speaks to men by revelation? Borncom says the Reformation was a return, quote, to the prophetic religiosity of primitive Christianity. The word prophetic is significant. He realizes, this great German scholar, that to return to the primitive church is to return to a church led by prophets. And that's what the Reformation should have been and actually tried to be. We're talking about the Protestant Reformation. The first enthusiasts of that Reformation, as of many earlier Reformations too, that wasn't the only one, they wanted before everything to get right back to the prophets not just to reading them, but to enjoying the actual gift of prophecy itself. And so we have such determined and enthusiastic men as Thomas Münzer and Karlstadt and Sebastian Frank, against whom in 1525 Luther wrote his work entitled Vida de Himmlischen Propheten, against the heavenly prophets. His objection was not that there should be no prophets, he would like to have had them too, but simply that these men were not prophets. With characteristic honesty, Luther saw that the mere recognition of the fact that prophets are necessary does not authorize one to be a prophet. Luther himself was very cautious on this head. Uh, he did not want a schism in the church, writes Borncom, but the renewal of the church of Christ. He deliberately put off giving new orders to the renewed churches, and he never felt that he himself was called to give orders. He actually waited 20 years before he admitted in the important writing, and we're quoting Borncom again, in the important writing concerning councils and churches in 1539, that the movement which he had inaugurated was not a provisional thing pending the general reform of the church for which he hoped, but was itself that reform. He was very reluctant to admit or think that he had launched the Reformation. Luther hoped for action by a general council. But what is the authority of such? If the intro, in the introduction to his famous work on councils, von Hefele, the Catholic bishop of Regensburg, shows that the question of whether even an ecumenical council is under the direction of the Holy Ghost has never been definitely settled. Luther's reform was promptly followed by a thoroughgoing reform of the Catholic Church itself, and that again was the work of a council, the most famous of, one of the most famous of all councils, the Tridentinum, at which the French and Spanish clergymen were alarmed and incensed over the claims of authority put forth by the Italians. Even there, the issue of authority was not clear. It was fought over a good deal. Today, it's admitted throughout the whole Christian world, and more so every day, that, and this is our last quotation from Borncom, that a plurality of churches contradicts the fundamental nature of a religion that claims that absolute truth which alone is commensurate with the character of a revealed religion. If you have a revealed religion, you shouldn't have a lot of churches. 
The true revealed church can only be one, but the reformers take many directions, and there is not a single church in the Christian world which is not the product of many reforms, and the largest of these churches has undergone the most numerous and the most thorough reforms of all, and now a new reform is proposed by which the many should become one. All the Protestants would amalgamate on the one hand and on the other hand, the Eastern and the Western churches should again become one. This illustrates the impossibility of restoring a divinely established system to its state of pristine divinity once men have spoiled it. For the oneness of the church is original to it. It's essential. It's not a thing contrived or achieved by ecumenical movements and fusions. It is not a unity that men work out in recognition of its logical necessity. It's a thing which is given to men with the church itself by divine direction. If, to quote Borncam's again, the plurality of churches contradicts that absolute church which alone is commensurate with the character of a revealed religion, such a plurality is nonetheless implicit in the proposition that reformers as such have the authority to act in the name of the Lord. For if the recognition of evils, the urge to correct them, and the guidance of the Bible if those things alone can authorize one man to step forth and change the church, they can also authorize another. And there's no end to the doctrines and factions that result. The church of Jesus Christ is not the product, as are all other churches in Christendom, of reformation or of counter-reformation. It is the product of direct revelation only. Changes there must be, but they can come in only one way, through a prophet of God.